In the new Tau Codex, which I received early, thanks to Games Workshop, you can realistically field an all Crute army. You have access to carnivores, far stalkers, Crute hounds, Crute oxes, rampagers, and even a few characters. But one thing that is missing is access to some hard-hitting anti-tank weaponry. So I decided to fix this by building the Crute equivalent of a broadside battlesuit. And here's how I did it. I started out with a new Krutox sprue. My initial idea was to simply cut up a regular broadside battlesuit and have a Krut piloting it. I decided to scrap this idea though, as I felt this would stand out a little too much among the more low-tech options that the Krut normally field. Instead, I would mount a railgun to the Krutox, creating a heavier version of it. Normally, the Krutox gunner stands upon the ox's hind legs and operates the gun from the back. But because the railgun was much larger, the rider would have to be placed elsewhere. I didn't know exactly where just yet, so I simply clipped away the rider's legs from the Krutox legs. I took great care here not to damage either part, and once they'd both been removed, I cleaned both parts up with my knife. With the rider's legs removed, I could assemble the main torso and legs of the Krutox. The railgun, naturally, came from the broadside battlesuit kit. But after a quick comparison against the Krutox, I realized that it was a little too long, especially with some of the arm parts that came attached. So with my saw, I removed the rear of the railgun and used the boxy section as a guide for my cut. I finished things off by cleaning up the cuts before assembling the railgun. After comparing the railgun against the Krutox's back, I realized that the gun would need to be propped up in order to lie parallel against the Krutox. But this would be a problem I would deal with later. For now, my focus was simply attaching the railgun to the Krutox. This was done with a 1mm hole drilled into the underside of the railgun before supergluing a length of 1mm wire into it and drilling a second hole into the Krutox's back. Once all of this was done, I trimmed the wire to length and superglued it into the hole in the Krutox. This held the railgun in position until I could pad out the gaps. At this point, the basic structure of the Krutox was there, but my next point of focus was on the rider. After assembling the legs and repeater cannon torso, I took the left arm that matched the torso alongside the left arm that held onto the tangle cannon. My task here was to join these two parts, giving the left arm a hand. After removing the hand from the cannon, I cleaned up both the hand and the arm before gluing them together at the wrist and then to the torso. For the right arm, I settled on a Crute Carnivore Spyglass right arm. After comparing both parts, I trimmed and adjusted them until they could both fit against the torso. From here, the arm and a Crutox rider head was glued to the torso, leaving me with the completed rider. The next few steps would see me doing a lot of green stuff work to help blend the harder edges of the railgun with the more organic lines of the Crute. So, after cutting and mixing up a batch of green stuff, a lump of it was pressed into place between the railgun and the back. Using my rubber tip sculpting tools and a little Vaseline to smooth things out, a series of folds and creases were pressed into the putty. This allowed me to create the appearance of a large sack of padding or supplies designed to hold the railgun steady. To further this effect, I used my knife to cut in a horizontal line across the outside of the sack before pressing in a series of small holes running adjacent to this line. These would form the holes for some stitching. In order to create the stitches themselves, I rolled out a very thin strand of green stuff and cut this up into some shorter sections. From here, I began the slow process of placing these stitches across the central seam. My aim here was to make the stitches look as though they emanated from the holes, and so my needle tool was used to press the stitches in. Once I'd finished this very slow process, the putty was left to fully cure. To improve that blend between the high-tech and low-tech, I removed the canister from the rear of the railgun, drilled a hole into one end, and superglued it to the rear of the pack. Next up was more green stuffing. After mixing up a fresh batch, I rolled out another few strands of various thicknesses. The thickest of the two strands were then flattened. Using a paintbrush handle as a rolling pin, I carefully pressed the green stuff to create a uniform width, leaving me with some straps. While the straps had been left to firm up a little, I used the remaining green stuff to fill in a few gaps that had been left around the Crute's torso and the Crutox itself. I didn't do anything too fancy here, and just followed the existing lines and edges. Once my straps had been left to cure for a couple of hours, they held their shape and edges while still being soft enough to be flexible. 
The thickest strap was laid across the railgun before using a little bit of my superglue to hold it into place. From here, the strap was pulled down towards the back of the crutox where I cut it to length and used the superglue once again to lock it in its position. This was repeated three more times until I was left with four points of contact with the crutox. I followed this up by using a similar method with a smaller strap and strands to create some cabling between the canister and the railgun itself. This helped to bring the two parts of the railgun together. While I still had some green stuff mixed up, I attached the Crute Rider to the Crutox, positioning him on the right forearm. This gave the Crute the appearance of bracing his left arm against the railgun whilst using his right arm to look for targets. As there were still some green stuff straps left over, I wrapped one of these around the Crute's left forearm and then beneath the railgun. This created the appearance of the rider using the strap to hold on. My final task in building this model was to add a few pouches and extra details to the model. These various pieces of equipment were sourced from Crute or Tau kits and were superglued to where the strap joined the Crute Ox's back. My reasoning here was to simply cover up some of the harsher transitions whilst also helping to further bulk out this broadside Crute Ox against its regular version. Once these were in place, I assembled the head and glued it into place. For the base, I kept things simple. The Crutox was mounted to the same 60mm base as a broadside battlesuit and surrounded by a few lumps of torn up cork. Regular viewers of my channel will be familiar with this process already, but you can create some surprisingly simple rocky outcrops by just tearing up chunks and supergluing them together. Now, before I show you how I painted this model, if you're enjoying this video, please do consider giving it a like and hitting the subscribe button. It helps me out and you can ensure that you're kept up to date with my latest guides just like this one. Oh, and be sure to turn on notifications on too. But for now, let's get to the painting. My first step was to prime the model and for this I used some of Colorforge's primer, specifically their Governor Green. This model would feature a lot of green, so it made a lot of sense to me to start off with this particular colour. When it came to painting the model, I approached things in pretty much the same few steps for each block of colour, so rather than repeating myself over and over again, I'm going to make things a little easier to listen to and explain the process first, and then just list the colours and their associated area. If there are any specific divergences, I will note these as necessary. So. First of all, I began by painting the chest plates and beaks of both the Crutox and the Rider. These were both base coated with Argonaut skin from the Tooth and Coats range. For each of my base coats, I mixed in a little water and applied a couple of thinner layers. This just allowed for better coverage, whilst also avoiding layering up the paint too thickly. The edges of these plates were then highlighted with Kronos flesh. This step saw me line the harder edges with a thin line of paint that is a little lighter than the base coat. This helps these edges to stand out against the surrounding areas and improves the overall level of detail. My final step for this area was something called an extreme highlight. This has the same basic concept as a regular highlight, but instead is much more focused. By painting just small darts of an even lighter color, Aries Flesh in my case, you can further that sharpness of detail. You'll get the best effect by focusing these dots to sharper edges or corners where two edges meet. From here, I then focused on the skin of both the Rider and the Ox with a layer of Fury Green. Layers are much like base coats, but instead of covering the whole area, you leave the recesses as the original colour, the Governor Green Primer in this case. The darker colour in the recesses gives the appearance of shadows and helps to build up that realism and level of detail. Washes can be used to build on this same effect. When applied over a surface, they lightly stain the surface and pull into the recesses, further darkening them down. In my case, I used some Battle Mud Wash and applied this over just the skin of the Crutox. The brown tone of this wash gave the skin a slightly deeper tone and would help to distinguish it further against the Crute Rider, who I would wash with Necrosis Green Wash instead. For the highlights, I tackled both the skin of the Ox and the Rider in the same way, starting out with Gung Ho Green, followed by Green Beret for a second highlight that focused more on the upper edges of the model, before I finished off the skin with an extreme highlight mix of Green Beret and Ivory Tusk to create an even lighter colour. For the quills, I began with an ashen grey base coat, washed those areas with Oblivion Black Wash, before starting the highlights first with Eidolon Grey, then Rodent Grey, and finally a very light mix of Rodent Grey and Ivory Tusk that I applied to just the tips of the quills. 
This model featured a lot of leather areas, so to break things up a bit, I approached them with two different tones of brown. For the leather plate on the Crutox's back, its bracer, and the Crute Rider's equipment, I began with scorched brown, followed by some oblivion black wash. My next steps here were to highlight these areas, first with ancient forest, and then some small dots of wasteland brown. I applied a few of these as scratches across the surface in order to give the leather a slightly worn and weathered look. From here, my attention turned towards the railgun itself. Taking inspiration from the Far Sight Enclave scheme, I began by painting a few of the panels with some dread red, before giving them a wash of Hellion red. The previous wash had stained the surfaces a little more than I'd liked though, so this was cleaned up with another layer of dread red. Following this, I moved on to the highlights. First up was Osmodius red, then Evil Eye red, and finally a few spots of Manticore ochre. As with the leather, a few of these highlights were applied as scratches across the red surfaces. For the remaining areas of the railgun, as well as the cabling, I began with the dark grey of Death Reaper. The recesses were then further darkened with some oblivion black wash, before I brought out the edges with a highlight of Dungeon Stone Grey, and then some Wizard Grey. My approach for the remaining leather areas of the model was to start off with some Druid Flesh, wash with some Battle Mud, then highlight with Paladin Flesh, and then Bard Skin. While these are flesh tones, their darker coloration works incredibly well to create a leather effect. To paint both the rack of ribs and the tuft of fur hanging from the Crutox's neck, I started with a base coat of Berserker Red, washed them with some more Hellion Red, and finished off with a couple of highlights using Sanguine Scarlet first, followed up with a few spots of the more intense Demon Red. By this point, my Crutox was very nearly complete, and all that was left to paint were the metallics. I began with some Sukkot Silver to, unsurprisingly, paint the silver areas across the model. These include the various buckles, studs, ammunition, and other details scattered across the ox and the rider. A little definition was created with a wash of Oblivion in Black, and I brought out those edges using some Mithril Blade. Following the silvers, I then base coated all of the golden details with some Dragon's Gold. But when it came to the washes, I decided to use two different washes to achieve a little variation. The first wash that I selected was Magi Purple, and this was used across the largest bangles around the Crutox's wrist. The purple tone of the wash created a richer, more burnished tone. By comparison, the archaic sepia wash that I used across the remaining areas retained the yellowish tone, whilst still offering some shading in those recesses. I then finished off both these golden areas with an edge highlight of glistening gold. The final area is to paint with a few remaining details such as the bones on the rack of ribs alongside some crude markings. When painting on these markings, my inspiration came from the various symbols and patterns across other crude miniatures and artwork. Using some dragon fang, I painted a series of geometric shapes and lines across the railgun. These weren't entirely necessary, but they helped to better blend the weapon into the rest of the model. I then applied a little archaic sepia wash across these areas and picked them out with a little vampire fang leaving me with a completed crude ox. This meant that I could turn my attention to the base. To create the effect of a dusty savannah, I began with some of AK Interactive's dry ground texture paste. This was liberally applied across the entire base, but I did take great care not to overspill onto the model itself. The paste was applied across the whole base, cork lumps and all, until I was left with a sandy surface. This was then left to dry for several hours. My next step was to use a combination of three washes to create a more natural looking base. These were Battle Mud, Archaic Sepia, and Necrosis Green, which were all placed in small spots across the base. From here, I then took a pipette of water and used it to dilute the spots of wash. My brush was then used to spread out these across the texture of the base until all the recesses had been covered. As this wash dried, the various earthy tones combined to create a more realistic looking surface color. From here, I then brought back the raised texture with a couple of passes of my dry brush, first using some vampire fang, and then some lighter ivory tusk. Then, to finish things off, I painted the rim with some Doom Death Black, sealed in the paintwork with a coat of matte varnish, and superglued a few grass tufts across the base, completing the mini and leaving me with this.
And here we have the finished Crute broadside. As someone who has always preferred an army built towards a theme rather than tactical viability, conversions can help to bridge that gap. While fielding a broadside in a crude themed detachment will prevent you from benefiting from certain rules, it does allow you to add some variation to your list without compromising on its style. Now, this isn't the only idea I've had for including other crude themed versions of tower units, so if you'd like to see more crude conversions in the future, please do let me know down in the comments below. If you'd like to give this model a go for yourself, you can find all the kits, tools and paints that I use to make this model down in the description. And be sure to tag me in anything you make after following this guide. I love seeing what you folks come up with. But before I go, I just want to thank my Patreon supporters and channel members, the people who are responsible for keeping these videos coming and keeping this channel alive in general, especially my Pouch of Dead Animal Bits tier and above supporters who are Andrew Consul, Axel Jonsson, Bartosz Sikowski, Berserker, Daniel Dowling, Hugh Wright, Ian, Immaterial Creations, Yazuya, Maciej Savitsky, Matt Brower, Molly Mork, Morgan, Mr. Grimm, Paljuice, Plops of Corn, Ryan Little, Splinkus, Swedsman, Tim, and Tom Haysmith. And my Sergeant Level channel members who are Night Lord Tim, Lloyd Davies, Dea, Trooper Geo, Mr. Jared Hessen95, David, John Gibbs, The Sire Acquired, Philip Oya, The Nonington and Paints, Mark Taylor, and Whale Tussler. So until next time, thanks for watching, and goodbye.